Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage moderator M. Wynn and our distinguished panel. All right, wow, that food looks really good. You're making me hungry. <laughs> Thank you all so much for being here. Thank you to our amazing panelists. We're gonna have a really great hour. Right now we're gonna be talking about voting rights, the importance of voting rights, the importance of voting for the AA NHPA, uh, NHPI community, and just the idea that the minority community has to come together in order to make their voice count. So let's start off with uh, introductions here. We have Jessica Jones Caporal. She's the Director of Government Affairs at the League of Women Voters in the US. We have Christine Chen, the co-founder and executive director of APIA Vote. We have Vita Lin, president of Asian Community Development Council. We have Dr. Anar Parikh, the policy associate AAAJ Atlanta. And we have Lily True, who's the interim ED at Asian Texans for Justice. Okay, so let's start off with just more introductions. Tell us a little bit more about yourself, a little bit more about your organization, and we'll start off with Jessica. Sure, thanks so much. Uh, so nice to be here with you all. Um, I'm Jessica, I work for the League of Women Voters. I'm the Director of Government Affairs, so I interact with uh, executive administration and um, the legislative legislatures, and also work with our state and local affiliates in all 50 states, as well as 750 communities across the country. Um, and the League of Women Voters really works to empower voters and defend democracy. Um, and that means uh, pass getting new policy reforms, uh, and uh, t you know, trying to do that at the state, local, um, and national level, as well as uh, working to inform voters around election time. So we have a one-stop shop for all of your election needs called Vote411 um, for uh, voters to find out all the information they need. Great. Hi, everyone. I'm Christine Chen, Executive Director for Asian and Pacific Islander American Vote. We're the um, nation's leading API organization focusing on building political power um, through increasing voter participation and civic participation. And the way we do this work is really um, building the capacity of local partners all around the country. Um, in addition um, to doing that, we are also about narrative change about our community, ensuring that um, data and research as well as information is provided so that way we are on the radar and they actually understand the growing power of this community and how political campaigns and uh, the media as well as um, candidates need to ensure that they engage with this growing growing electorate. Hi, I'm Vida Lin, president and founder of the Asian Community Development Council in Nevada, where we're one of the fastest growing Asian population at 392,000 Asian and Asian Pacific Islander there. Hi everyone, my name is Anar Parikh. Um, I am at Asian Americans Advancing Justice Atlanta. Advancing Justice Atlanta is a legal advocacy organization um, that advocates for the rights of Asian American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander, South Asian, Muslim, and Middle Eastern communities in Georgia and the Southeast. Um, our work is focused a lot on um, voter and civic engagement, and I am, um, I have a um, background in um, cultural anthropology, and I'm focusing on the, our language access effort, efforts in the policy advocacy department. Hi everyone, my name is Lily True, my pronouns are her or she, her. Um, I am one of the co-founders and the current interim executive director of Asian Texans for Justice. Um, we are a 501c3 in Texas. We serve the 1.9 million AAPIs in Texas. Texas has the third largest population of AAPIs in this country, only after California and New York. I see some surprise faces, a lot of folks don't know that. Um, so we at Texas are really proud of our really diverse uh, population and at ATJ what we do is we connect the AAPI community with civic action um, to build personal and political power. A round of applause for our panel, please. So 
So today we are talking about voting rights. Of course, the Voting Rights Act back in 1965 was signed into law in which the minority community, namely African Americans, were having a lot of obstacles to get to the ballot box. And we're talking about literacy tests. We're talking about poll taxes, right, Jessica? Yeah, the uh, Voting Rights Act is probably the premier piece of legislation to make sure that a minority voters got the right to vote. Uh, it puts the, the promises of the 14th, 15th, and even the 19th Amendment, where women got the right to vote, uh, into, into action um, and into, uh, into legislation. And it's been reauthorized multiple times um, by both in a bipartisan way with both uh, Democrats and Republicans supporting it. Um, and unfortunately, in 2013, uh, a court decision uh, invalidated the formula that's kind of at the heart of vo uh, the Voting Rights Act. Uh, but that doesn't mean uh, we, we haven't stopped trying to stop voter suppression laws around the country. Um, and uh, it's, yeah, it's just a prim premier piece of legislation to um, make sure that um, everyone um, in this room and around the country can vote. And before we get into all the challenges, you know, we talk about the number of people who have to have access to voting. And this includes back in 1992 when there was a surge of Vietnamese immigrants who came to the United States. Uh, Christine, how exactly does the VRA still help today? Right, so um, the Voting Rights Act, there has a section called Section 203. This was uh, incorporated in 1975 to really address the language needs of um, different minority communities. So what happens is that every 10 years when you um, complete the census, they take that information and then they decide which jurisdictions have a minimum of either 10,000 individuals or 5% of a language minority community. If they meet that threshold, then by law, they have to provide language assistance to outreach to those ethnic uh, minority um, communities to actually um, translate a, a lot of voter education materials and the ballots in itself. So we know that over a third of our communities are limited English proficient. So there is a huge need in that. And that's why um, APCAT vote, along with all of our partners here, as well as across the country, back in 2022, we were able to reach a million households with an in-language mailer. With 33 different versions and um, 14 different languages, we were able to like reach them um, with, you know, to ensure that they needed the language needs that they wanted. And then as soon as the mail landed, we received thousands of phone calls on our 888 API vote hotline. Now, for those that don't necessarily meet that threshold bar close, um, Regardless, Section 208 also provides you um, the ability to bring a family member or a friend to the polling location to actually assist you. And uh, we also know that with um, early voting, over two thirds of our community in 2022, as well as 2020, decide to use early voting more than any other ethnic um, or racial minority. Um, because we know when you have limited English, pro um, if you're limited English proficient, you need assistance with your family and friends. And that's why you, utilizing early voting is one of the best ways to get our um, community to turn out to vote. We can leave it to Christine to break down all the sections for us. <laughs> So let's uh, talk about your organization specifically. What are their perspectives on the VRA and the recent attempts to restrict voting? And how does that impact the AA and NHPI community? And also, what are the obstacles and challenges that have impacted the VRA? And what ways are your organizations working to address these challenges? We'll start with Vita. So um, I started the Asian Community Development Council in 2015. And Christine Chan came to visit me and say, I'm going to give you a small grant to do voter registration. And I said, I have no idea how to do that. And I, I was always in the chamber business, our own business or whatever. But I said, no to her first. Then I got yelled at from some of the people on my board. I said, OK, yes, we'll take your money and we'll do this, right? So she gave me a, you know, some money. And it came kind of late. It came in like September, October time. So we start registering people to vote. And I did not know how hard it was to register our community to vote because they, we don't want to get political, we don't know what's going on. And I'm like, how do I do this, right? So on my board, I have a lot of people um, that's from the gaming industry, Caesars and MGM and Station Casino, all, all of them and us, other people on the board. I said, can I go to the back of the house to register people to vote? 
So I was the only organization that was allowed to go in the back of the house because they trusted that when I worked in Nevada for over 20 years, that they know if I'm going to register people to vote, that's all I'm going to do and not causing any other trouble, right? So I went back of the house and registered people to vote. And I went to all the Caesars property, I went to the station casino property in the back, and I found out many of them were back of the house workers, were permanent residents, but never became citizens. So we started the whole citizenship program from that, right? So we did the back of the house, registered the people to vote. We're a 24-hour town. We're not like other states. How do we get to our people, right? So we went to the back of the house, registered people. I actually attended one of those hip-hop club thing to register people to vote. And one of my staff said to me, he goes, you're not going to get anyone to register to vote. So I registered 24 people. That's great. So, you know, never say, you know, you can't, right? So I had no idea in 2015, and I only registered 700 people total, right? And she wanted me to register 1,600. I said, okay, I'm Asian. I only did 700 out of 1,600 do the math. I'm like F minus, F minus, right? <laughs> I'm never going to get funding from her again, right? So she said, it's okay, 700 is better than more than we ever had before, right? I'm like, what? So she's gonna register, you know, she's gonna try to get me funding for 2016. So in 2016, we registered over 3,100 people. <laughs> but the midterm election in 2018, we registered over 14,000 people. But the most important thing that I learned from registering people to vote was the power that we built. Because when I moved to Nevada, and I went to the elected official before, they say, we don't want to talk to the Asian community because you don't vote. So when we did the 14,000, guess what? They pay attention to us, right? We changed the dynamic of our community when we got people of color, people who's never been asked that their voice was important. And we did crazy things to register people to vote, which I hope I have an opportunity to talk about later. Thank you. Go ahead, Onar. Um, yeah, thank you. So, you know, Christine mentioned Section 203 of the Voting Rights Act, which focuses primarily on um, language access provisions for language minority voters. And um, it is one of the aspects of the Voting Rights Act that's still intact. Um, one thing, however, that we found in Georgia is that the thresholds for um, coverage under Section 203 are so high that it is um, almost prohibitive, it's prohibitive towards um, including Asian American voters in many places. Um, and the definition of uh, what is a language minority group in Section 203 is so narrow that often groups are not considered inclusive. Um, and in Georgia, we, right now, we only have one county that is covered by Section 203, that's Gwinnett County for Spanish, no, uh, no Asian languages. Um, so at Advancing Justice Atlanta, there's a couple of things that we've done. One is trying to make sure that we are a provider of in-language resources for, um, limit, uh, for language minority communities. We provide resources in Chinese, Korean, Vietnamese, Arabic, uh, Hindi, and Urdu, as well as Spanish and, and English. Um, and then the other thing is that, you know, we'll talk about this a little bit later, but in southern states, uh, the state level policy route is often very limited. So, but we do have several counties and municipal entities that are interested in and committed to providing language access. So we've been working with counties to pass resolutions and ordinances that um, commit to language equity and community collaboration in providing in-language materials, both um, in, you know, sample ballots and other language materials provided uh, by counties. Yeah, so I mean, I think so much of what everyone on this panel has said I've really resonated with from a Texas perspective. I don't know if this may come as a surprise to the folks in this room, but in Texas, we make it really hard to vote. Um, and so, you know, in Texas, there are a number of things that we do to make it really hard to vote, which is why the Voting Rights Act is so important to our state, but we, to this day, don't have online voter registration. So to register to vote in Texas, you need pen, you need paper, you have to physically mail this form in. 
Um, we don't have same day voter registration. Our voter registration deadline is two weeks prior to election day. Actually, I think it's a month prior to election day. Um, so if you don't plan in advance, and most um, non-English speaking folks may not be paying attention to the precise dates of early voting or election day. Um, our voter registration forms are not widely available in different languages. We talk about in language being so important. Um, only select counties who choose to invest in it offer voter registration form in, in Asian languages. So Harris County of the greater Houston area has it. Um, now Travis County of the greater Austin area has it, but it is up to local officials. And oftentimes they don't have the staffing or the resources to do that. Um, we have lots of restrictions around voting by mail. We have lots of restrictions around early voting. Um, it's, you know, frankly a miracle. We even have early voting. So all of this has been in place in Texas for a long time. Um, some may call it voter suppression. In 2021, our state legislature actually took it a step further and proposed um, many new changes to, to the voting laws um, that would actually make it more restrictive. And so for folks who follow state politics, you may, ha you may remember that in 2021, the Texas legislature had a few special sessions because we couldn't agree on a lot of these pretty egregious voter suppression um, proposals. And the Democratic Party, um, so Texas is a Republican supermajority state, so Republicans own every chamber, every major um, state elected office. And so the Democratic members of the Texas House did the one thing they knew they could do, which was to break quorum. So they came together and they actually agreed as a body to not show up. And what they did, because they had to flee the state, because when you break quorum, um, the, the, the Speaker of the House can compel you back into the building. So they actually deployed the Department of Public Safety, the troopers or state troopers, to actually find the members and bring them back um, to the House to, to continue business. And the Democratic members actually fled the state um, and they all came to DC. And the reason why they came to DC is they came to ask um, the members of Congress to do what they could to pass the John Lewis Voting Rights Act because um, we knew we needed those federal supports. And, you know, and I can talk in more detail about what some of these proposed changes were in, in 2021, but a lot of those changes had disproportionate impacts on the AAPI community. And spoiler alert, those voter suppression efforts did pass. Um, eventually, because the federal government was not able to pass, to pass the John Lewis Act, um, our Democratic members had to come back to Texas and they had to take a vote and ultimately they lost. Um, and those new laws were enacted in 2021 and those did have deep impacts on the API's um, ability to, to participate in the 2022 elections. Um, so federal policy has deep, deep impacts on the things that happen in the states. And speaking of Texas and on a state level, how has recent legislation, just in the past couple of years, how has that impacted on a state level to the people who are around the state uh, in terms of voting um, and just impacted the ballot box access in general? Yeah, I, I can share two quick anecdotes because they passed so many horrible uh, legislation in, in, in 2021. Um, but two things we know disproportionately impacted API voters. One change that they um, were able to pass in 21 actually made it more difficult to request for a um, mail-in ballot. And so for, I think a lot of like senior elderly APIs who maybe aren't, can't you know, make it in person to the, to the ballot box, um, folks who maybe are out of town, maybe you're visiting family you know, in Asia and you're not here on election day, um, we made it much more difficult, um, not just for the API community, but for all community members to request a ballot by mail. And so we actually saw in 2022 that there were huge numbers, tens of thousands of applications that were rejected. And the Brennan Center um, for Justice, they actually published a report that showed that API applications for mail-in ballot were rejected at a higher rate than any other racial group. So we know that this particular policy passed in 2021 deeply impacted us. The second thing um, that was passed in 2021 that had deep impacts on our community is um, we, they created new language around how and when a person can be assisted at the polling place. So I think about my parents, right? My parents are Vietnamese refugees. They still don't really speak English. They, they don't vote regularly. So when they do vote, they need me to go with them to help them. Navigating the voting machines, figuring out like, you know, are they doing it right? Now, in order to help somebody at the polls, there's a number of forms you have to sign. There are affidavits you have to sign. Um, these are all forms of voter suppression and voter intimidation. 
Because now when you walk into the polling place, you have to sign all these official looking legal documents that you may or may not understand just to help your parents or your grandparents or your, your aunts and uncles vote. And so that we know disproportionately impacts the AAPI community and really all communities of color. Um, and so these are just a few laws that were passed in 2021. Um, more bad news, our state legislature is in session right now. And there are more bills proposed this session that continues to erode our right to vote and to participate in the election process. Um, so if you guys want good news from Texas, you'll have to find me for a sidebar later. And how about Georgia and our... Yes, so um, you know a lot of the a lot of similar things that are happening in Texas are also happening in Georgia. The big uh, voter suppression, or you know, in other um, others might use the word election security bill from 2021 SB 202. Mail-in ballots and early voting were two of the main targets, um, and as we said, marginalized voters and a PI voters are among the most frequent users of those mechanisms, um, you know, it's just harder to vote. That's ultimately what it is. What I also wanna talk about is some of the sort of like cultural impacts of these voter suppression bills. So even if, um, you know, there's, there's the formal ways that it's been affected, but also the ways in which people get really scared. Um, and so, you know, we work with counties on trying to push counties to provide more languages uh, more in-language materials in various languages, and counties are afraid to implement some of those policies or will say, you know, the state election board says that you can only provide these materials in English, even if that's necessarily not the case. But there's just so much fear around voting. Um, the other thing that's come up in Georgia is uh, mass voter challenges. So, um, you know, people are spying on people when they go to drop boxes to to uh, submit their mail-in ballots. They're looking at voter rolls and trying to contest ballots of people who are already voting. All of these things have com contributed to a deep stigma and culture of fear around voting to the extent that people don't wanna talk about it, are afraid to go, you know, are afraid of running into issues and when they run into issues into combative people, which is, you know, all of that put together is really creating a really scary environment for voting. And uh, our state legislative session just wrapped up at the end of March. And again, you know, some things were more successful than others, but the, the success of the 2021 voter suppression bills have created a pathway for other bills to keep adding on and adding on, um, including you know, intimidating uh, county election workers from you know, even having enough funds to run elections in, in the most diverse counties. And Vita, is language access also impacted? Yes, it is. And it is funny. I'm listening to what's going on over the different states, and I say, thank goodness Nevada's like this. Right? <laughs> so in 2018, we started um, a C4 side, too, which is run separately in a separate group of people. And what they did was push to get same day to go online voter registration and also same day voters, right? We also pushed to have Chinese language in the um, in the ballot, right? So these are things that we've did that's completely opposite. S but what, also, what we do is, I think uh, ACDC is you, really unique, is that we work with the election department very closely. Our outreach teams are all registered fields. We get trained, we're registers with them, right? We kind of remind them, say, hey, we're helping you do your job. We're gonna bring our community out We'll help with the language if the language is an issue. We'll help what we can do to get our community out there, right? So when they pass the law that we can have Chinese language, they say, it's great, we pass it, but there's no funding. So what we did in 2020, we actually had someone donate money to us, and we did the translation in Chinese and got 5,500 booklets out to our community and make sure that they have those things. So every time they say there's a language issue or there's other issues, we have to think about what we can do. So in Nevada, since it's a 24-hour town, guess what? We can't go on a Tuesday or early voting because they're working, right? So that mail-in ballot was really important for us to have. And in 2020, when the whole pandemic hit, when everything was shut down, they looked to us, our community, to do translation 
The governor said, can you do translation in different languages? What is essential worker, what is not essential workers? They reached out to us and say, do translation, language translation for the school district, what are virtual learning and how do they get their Chromebooks, right? So we have to be like to the community, the go-to when it comes to language because they're not gonna, we can pass as much as we want if they don't have funding and they don't, they don't think it's important, we have to, as a community, figure out how to do and push things through. So during the 2020, when everything was shut down, we still had to think of how I get my 30 canvassers that we hire to go to meet with people. How do we do it, right? But when we registered young people in 2018, they were thinking about how to do social media and get the message out. How do we get, you know, how do we get the mail-in ballot, right? So. 42% of our community went to early voting, drop off in the mail, because that was easy for our community as a 24-hour town, right? So we have to work with elected officials, officials. we have to look, work with the um, people and come together. So when we register a lot of young people, we notice the registration now is one-third Republican, one-third Democrat, and one-third nonpartisan. And a lot of young people are nonpartisan because they want to know what is going to affect them when they go out to the poll. That's really interesting. And we are coming on to our last question, so we will take questions from the audience after this, so be thinking about that. Um, okay, so what does the future of the VRA look like? How can advocacy groups come together around the VRA to ensure that the AA NHPI community's voices are heard? And what policy solutions can support this work? And we can start with Christine. Um, so, you know, um, Congress is going to be looking to reintroduce the Freedom to Vote Act, um, which is one per, uh, which allows provisions such as making Election Day a national holiday um, to actually be able to instill no excuse mail-in ballots. As a reminder, as you heard, um, you know, f from our colleagues here, you know, Texas, I believe Texas and Georgia in 2020, they had a high early voting and mail-in ballots, but it actually decreased in 2022 because of all these voter suppression tactics, right? But once again, as a reminder, that's the most preferred way to actually vote. So we want this federal law to be able to get passed so that way we can make that readily available across all the states. Um, there's also, um, in that act, they're also providing um, a wider range of non-photographic IDs. Um, so then that way, you know, especially college students where many times they're being turned away at the ballot box because they are saying that their um, their ID is not acceptable. Um, also a wide a range of ways to be able to register to vote as, as well as same day registration. The Freedom to Vote Addict is a great bill. It provides standards for voting all across the country. So what you know, some states are already implementing, um, just brings everyone up to the same level. Um, but there's also uh, another piece of legislation that's really important, it's the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act. Um, it's, some version of it has been introduced uh, since the Shelby v. Holder decision in 2013. We expect to see another version of it introduced in this Congress as well. Unfortunately, there's another Supreme Court case that's challenging Section 2 of the VRA, so I think we'll probably be waiting to see what happens in that case before we see that bill um, reintroduced. Um, you know, I, I'm an eternal optimist, um, so I like to think that there's opportunities um, everywhere, not just at the federal level, but at the state level. And thanks to um, these great partners on the state or on the on the stage, <laughs> who are working at the state level um, to implement in community change um, and to work uh, for good good policies at the state level, um, I hope that the federal government will just take those good things um, and rise them up to the national level. So I'm I'm hopeful that we'll get there but who knows we've got a long fight ahead of us hopeful that's hopeful. good <laughs> and I know you know across the nation there are states that are pushing to expand voter access as well um, but anyway so we have uh, if we have any questions from the audience we have a couple of mics gonna come around we'll just take the first one here with this gentleman right there thank you so much uh, Obviously, the state of Texas just passed a, a bill that would not just make it hard for people to vote, but to actually have their votes overturned in Harris County. Uh, and so the question I have is, first of all, uh, I'm not a lawyer, oops, but I can see so many problems with the equal protection clauses and, and, and violations of the Constitution. Does that 
do you see the Department of Justice coming in and, and doing something about that particular provision? And is this a bill that's going to go to the state Supreme Court or the federal or the U.S. Supreme Court? Yeah, th that is a great question. I too am not a lawyer, so uh, disclaimer. You know, take take my take my word with a grain of salt. Um, it, for anyone who follows Texas state politics, you'll you'll know that a lot of bad policies go through our state house. What that ultimately me ultimately means is we're an extremely litigious state. Uh, so many of these bills do end up getting challenged, and, and the vast majority end up getting challenged within our state, and they go up through the Texas uh, court system, up to the Texas Supreme Court, uh, which begs another uh, problem with our system is all of our judges in Texas are elected, including our Texas Supreme Court judge, uh, judges. They are elected um, in partisan races. Um, and so, you know, a lot of times when I think about a lot of these bad bills, we rely deeply on our friends at ACLU Texas, at the Texas Civil Rights Project. Um, those are civil rights um, law organizations, nonprofits that do a lot of the heavy lifting in terms of looking for litigious ways to repeal some of these bad policies. But what we really need in Texas is democracy reform, really reforming the way elections work. I'm gonna just give you more bad news since I'm up here and I'm already on a roll. Um, something else that's recently been passed is Texas has actually passed a constitutional amendment that bans rank choice voting, which we know to be a positive form of democracy reform that really allows for the electorate's, um, the electorate's voices to come through. And so really what we need is federal policy. What we really need is protection from federal policy because the legislature is going to continue to propose and to pass um, legislation that's going to restrict our voting rights and and unless we have the federal government protecting us and and, and you know really um stopping some of some of these cases um you know texas is going to continue to be a state where voting is very very difficult we have another question here hi my name is john i'm a second year student at uc san diego i want to bring the conversation back to um redistricting and gerrymandering i know you were t touching on that earlier and very thankful for that so my question is kind of broad, but what do you think we should be doing as advocates and organizers to directly counter the effects of disenfranchisement through gerrymandering? There should be independent processes for redistricting, and there has to be transparency. Um, there are good systems in California and Arizona that are done through independent commission processes. There has to be transparency. We cannot have maps that are um, passed in the the wee mornings of the hour, um, you know, and Democrats gerrymander, Republicans gerrymander, um, but it's really important for us as uh, people to be involved in um, redistricting, to talk to our legislators, to talk to our neighbors, uh, to get people out to talk about what our communities look like, how our communities um, should be uh, grouped together or not grouped together, um, and uh, to really be involved in the process. I just want to add that many, unfortunately, many of the redistricting process has already ended for, and we have to live and work with what we have right now, but we have to start thinking about 2030 that when the census happens, right? So we need to start thinking who gets elected in um, 2028 and 2030 because they're going to be able to decide on what that redistricting process is going to look like at the state level. Any other questions? Don't be shy. <laughs> so I have a question for the panel, which is a couple things. You know, we talked about what you may describe as voter suppression. Others may say that it's to prevent widespread fraud in the election. What are your thoughts on that argument? I can give another terrible Texas example. <laughs> Um, so, this is, I'm just on a roll today. So, one of the pieces of legislation that's, that was proposed this session that's actually being considered now. Uh, so, currently, illegal voting in Texas is uh, classified as a misdemeanor A, uh, which is pretty serious. You can get fined, you can face up to a year in prison. So, I, I consider that a pretty uh, serious classification already. There's a bill that actually proposes that illegal voting uh, be raised to be a felony. And so think about the immigrant community or think about folks who maybe have lived in this country a long time and just have never voted and don't really know what to do. You're in a state where voting already feels, you know, really hard, really intimidating. Now they're telling you if you do it wrong, it's a felony. And they're going to tell you they're doing it to protect our electoral process. They're, they're telling you they're doing it for fair elections. So most of the times when I hear that, I just hear uh, another form of voter suppression. 
In Texas, our Secretary of State's also an appointee. Our Secretary of State is appointed by the governor, um, not elected like in Georgia. I know you guys have an elected Secretary of State. This session, they're also looking to give the Secretary of State disproportionate amounts of power. Um, you know, the ability to audit an election and to throw out the results, all the way down to giving the Secretary of State the power to, to actually write and to determine the, the language of local propositions. Uh, we just voted in a local proposition uh, in Austin. We had two propositions, both were about police reform, both read to be the exact same, when in reality, they would have done opposite things. So we already know that local propositions are written in a way that's really confusing. By giving the Secretary of State a political appointee more power to determine how the language in a local proposition is written. Um, once again, you are just creating ways um, of confusing the voter, making it hard for them. They are again saying that it would create fairer elections, right? You have one person at the highest level um, helping to make the electoral process easier when it's, it's not. It's really designed to confuse and to dissuade people from participating. Um, I promise Texas is a lovely place to live, uh, but I just have so many examples of, of things happening in our state. Um, you know, it's ironic that Texas is trying to give more power to the Secretary of State because in Georgia this year during the state legislative session, there was a bill that attempted to separate the state election board from the Secretary of State's office precisely because certain actors and stakeholders were not happy with the way that the Secretary of State's office, which is an elected position in Georgia, handled um, you know, certain parts of the election, in other words, not overturning the election. You know, to directly answer M's question about what we think, what some of us think about the sort of like election security versus, uh, you know, voter suppression distinction, I think one thing that's super important to constantly remind ourselves is that individual acts of voter fraud are extremely, extremely rare. And there are instances where people do, who are not eligible to vote may end up engage, registering or voting, but often that's not because somebody has intentionally set out to vote uh, illegitimately. It's because people do get, um, are told that they are eligible to vote and they attempt to register and learn only later that they, that, that they were not eligible. There's a number of things that happen that don't have to do with malicious intent on individuals' um, basis. But we also know that elections, you know, that the way elections are run is also um, often complicated. So um, I think that really keeping that in mind is super important when we try to parse through these various like narrative or di discursive or dis you know ways that um, the attempt to suppress voters is is framed. The other thing I want to just add is that in in this like conversation about voter suppression, especially in places like Georgia it becomes really easy to take exclusively a defensive approach that is uh, focused on trying to combat some of these policies. And that becomes so narrow that we don't even let ourselves have the capacity to push what already exists beyond what it exists. So uh, the personal hill I will die on, for example, is the limited English proficiency category, which really is a deficiency-oriented framework of thinking about how people use language and focused on um, measuring it against people's ability to speak language. Uh, one of the things that we are working on is trying to shift that towards thinking about non-English language preference as a way to think about uh, people who use languages other than English in, in their everyday lives, and also pushing um, at the county level, at, at various levels that we can for legislators to incorporate all speakers of a particular language when they consider implementing language policies, not just those of limited English proficiency. Because the benefit of having materials in languages other than English is not just for those who, who don't use it, which it is, who don't, who are not, um, who don't have facility in English, which it is, but also for someone like me, who's a heritage speaker of a language like Gujarati, getting to see materials in my language and in not is, is important, you know? It's a way for us to preserve our relationships to our language, which are, you know, sort of like, as, as Julie mentioned this morning, um, you know, often lost in the process of assimilation. So I just, you know, also want to say that like, you know, as we fight defensively that we also have to think about expanding and, and pushing past the, th the, the, the things that already exist. Um, so, yeah. 
So can I say something a little bit on the positive side? <laughs> you know, they're going to always say something, right? Oh, this was wrong with constant. That's never going to stop. But what we need to do is first in Nevada, when I first moved to Nevada, people didn't even vote. Nobody was engaged, right? Now we've, like in 2016, moved that. We woke them up. It's time for them to have a voice. It's time for them to stop saying, my one voice is not going to change. Because I said, you know how close the elections are? Your voice definitely going to make a difference, right? But we also have to think about getting our young folks, getting them engaged, and get them to run for office. Because the older generation is not going to run for office because, number one, you don't get paid a lot. You know how we are. There's no money in running for election. Number two, we like our privacy. And when you run for office, you're private, nothing private, right? <laughs> and number three, we don't want to get yelled at. When you elect the office, you get yelled at all the time. People like you and people hate you, right? But let's get our young people, because they're so brave. And it's about their future, right? So when we did this whole voter registration in 2018, we found out the young people were engaged. But they would bring their parents to help to come to the poll. They would get everybody else. But we have to make it fun for them too, right? So we hired this one person named Eric Jung who handles outreach, voter registration and so forth. He comes up to me and goes, like, hey, for the early voting, can we do um, bubble tea and bento boxes for people when they go to Chinatown to early vote? I said, sure. And can we do puppies? OK, why? <laughs> bubble for puppies. Everybody loves puppies. Like, OK. So I said, OK, I listened to them, right? Then they say, let's get, you know, the limousine. We, you know, Las Vegas entertainment capital, we have a lot of party bus, right? We have the party bus, goes to the school, to the colleges, and say, hey, you want to go vote? You know, order voting start today. And they go like, uh, we're in school, or we're in class, or uh, maybe next time they go, well, we have a party bus parked right there. You want to go? And they all jump on, go vote. Some of them first-time voters. And they come back, right? Engage them, right? And then they come back to me and say, hey, Let's do this. And I was like, okay, what's the next plan, right? Baby goats for your vote. Seriously? <laughs> Seriously? They actually had a petting zoo who brought baby goats and other stuff in the area to register people to vote. We make it fun, right? And don't tell me about the K-pop. <laughs> I said, okay, do whatever you do, but let's engage our community and let's engage our young people, because it's about them, and we need to listen to them, right? So all these naysayers and all these suppression and whatever, get our people to register, get them to vote, get them to run for office, and we'll then change something. Thank you, Christine. I would go to that event. <laughs> right, baby, go for your vote. Come on. Right, exactly. I'm looking forward for the next idea. <laughs> so we just have about a minute left. I just wanted to say, wow, incredible. Uh, the panelists had just amazing stories to tell. And you know, as we grow up and we see our parents who came here, who maybe felt as if they wanted to keep their head down, maybe they felt as if, oh, we don't need to be a part of the electoral system. And these are parents or grandparents or even yourself. You know, we do have to be a part of the system. We have to speak up because only then will our voice count, right? And I think there was a statistic that I was looking at, but in 2020, API saw the highest increase in voter turnout, and that's thanks to, you know, people like Vita and people like Christine and everyone up here. But we still have to do a lot more. There's still so much to do because it's not just about the AA and NHPI community, it's about all minority communities, it's about all communities who need to have their vote count, right? So thank you so much to the panel. Another round of applause. Um, um, I, I, was, I was wondering if I could just take another 30 seconds of everyone's time that's not related to voting rights, actually. Um, I think as a nation, we've become really desensitized to, to mass shootings because they happen so frequently. Um, so folks may have seen that yesterday there was a mass shooting in Allen, Texas. Uh, that is a suburb of the Dallas-Fort Worth area. I think what a lot of folks don't know, the media is not reporting, it is, it is a 20% API dense community. Um, and one of the victims that have been confirmed to have, to have died yesterday is actually a South Asian woman. And so 
I just wanted to name that so that folks, I'm sorry, I'm like getting a little emotional, but I just want to name that so that folks carry it with them um, because mass shootings impact our community too. Um, and, and unfortunately, we have all become a bit desensitized to just our frequency in which it happens. And so my heart is with the Allen, Texas community, and I just hope that you guys are all thinking of them and sending your well wishes that way.